So let me get my notes out. There's a bunch of different things uh, within Philippians 4 that uh, we want to cover. So I'm going to start with the first verse, um, which is Paul beginning to wrap things up. He's beginning to slow down. He's beginning to crystallize the essence of his message. We've spent a month now, over a month, going through this whole book. Now we're reaching his summary and that, that, that beautiful crystallization of the message of joy, okay? That's what, that's what this is all boiling down to, okay, is joy. So this is how it starts. He, he, he says, or I should say this is how it ends. My dear and precious friends whom I deeply love, you have truly become my glorious joy and crown of reward. Now arise in the fullness of your union with our Lord. Can I say that to you again? Can I actually say that to you listening right here? Right, you, right there. My dear and precious friends whom I deeply love, you have become my glorious joy and crown of reward. Now arise in the fullness of your union with our Lord. Um, there is so much there. Just I can't I can't camp here because we've got a long journey in the rest of this chapter. But but just to say one thing about this, that Paul calls the Philippians his joy and crown is astounding. There is an astounding revelation in that about what our rewards in heaven are. Listen, li listen carefully with the with the inner ear here. Okay, there's mysteries hidden in the word uh, that that you don't understand unless you tie together parts of the Bible because it's one author who wrote this book. It's written by many different human authors, but there's one underneath. There's one author underneath who has mysteries that you can, you can begin to thread together, okay? So many of you are aware that in the Bible, it talks about how we're gonna receive crowns one day. We're gonna, we're gonna receive this inheritance of a city with these precious jewels and streets of gold and all of that. And um, a lot of people believe that, you know, when we die and we stand before the Lord and he gives us rewards for our work on earth that, you know, we, we think of these rewards in terms of physical things like, OK, um, because I was a martyr, I'm going to get like a, a double decker McMansion in heaven. But, you know, if I just served in, uh, you know, in the usher ministry, what's up to my ushers out there? <laughs> if I just did that and that was all I did with my life, didn't, you know. Uh, didn't die a martyr, well, I'm going to get a, a nice little cottage on the east side of, you know, New Jerusalem. Um, and, you know, maybe if I did something in between, I don't know, you know, there's all kinds of different stuff that we could do. And we think that, okay, we get different rewards based on what we did for the Lord. I believe there's a secret here. I think there's a mystery here. When Paul says to the Philippians, he says, you are my joy and my crown. And I love in the Passion Translation, he adds the crown of reward. I believe our reward in heaven is our relationships that we establish on earth now. Our reward in heaven are the people that we impact. That's why they're eternal rewards. That's why they're rewards of gold and silver and precious stones because people, us, we are the precious stones. So our reward in heaven is people is the people that we impact, that we see in heaven, the people that we lead to the Lord, the people that we disciple and sow into, uh, the, the people that we just love. Those are our rewards. Those are, and, and, and it's going to be a shock. I think it's going to be a big shock on that day uh, for a lot of people who are expecting certain types of reward and, and they're going to realize at the end of the day, everything else passes away except for love. So I'll leave that with you, but we're going to keep going on with Paul and the rest of this this, uh, this book, because there's some amazing uh, stuff here. So, so he says, arise in the fullness of your union with the Lord. There is not a more applicable word to us right now, to the body of Christ and the call to arise. That is the season that we're in. We are called to arise and shine in this hour. That's what Jesus is doing. And that's Paul's call to the church, arise and shine. Now he's going to continue to summarize his thoughts, but he first interrupts his whole chain of thought by addressing a conflict in the church. This is interesting. He stops and he says, and I plead with Eudaya and Syntyche to settle their disagreement and be restored with one mind in our Lord. 
And I would like my dear friend and burden bearer to help resolve this issue. For both women have diligently labored with me for the prize and helped in spreading the revelation of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers. All their names are written in the book of life. Okay. Um, Paul uh, stops his, his thinking here to all of a sudden address uh, a conflict, a disagreement between two women in the church. And um, it it's doesn't come as a surprise based on, you know, what I just shared about how our joy and crown is people. Like, it just puts the spotlight on the fact that this whole thing is about relationship. And Paul invests time into this letter and, and pen and ink, you know, was time and money back then. And, you know, there's there he, he could only say so much. He could only he could only speak so much to the Philippian church. He had I'm sure he had tons of things he wanted to say, but he only had a little bit of time and a little bit of paper to get it out as he's sitting in his house arrest. But he but he devotes a whole paragraph to addressing a conflict of relationship within the church. And I just wanted to I don't want to go deep into that teaching right now. I just wanted to point that out that this just shows, you know, Paul's Paul's heart. And, you know, there's so many other things that Paul could have stopped and talked about. He could have like, tell, you know, specifically addressed an, an issue to do with like missions or evangelism. He could have said, you guys need to, you know, get out there more and do more evangelism. You need to be out there doing more missions work or giving more money to the poor. And he doesn't, he doesn't say those kind of things, which is interesting. He stops and he addresses two individual ladies and he says, I, I want you both to resolve this disagreement. So that's just, I just find that amazing. And, and I like, again, in the Passion Bible, there's study notes and footnotes. And there's this footnote to this particular um, story that Dr. Simmons, uh, the translator, adds in. He says, in every church, there's often found conflict in relationships. Paul seeks to encourage these two dear women to resolve all their disagreements. But their name gives us a clue. Udiah comes from a word that means a fair journey. Syntyche comes from a word that can mean an accident. Along our fair journey, we may collide with another, but God always has grace for restoration. So I love that. That's beautiful. So Paul just throws that in there in his letter to the church. He's like, look, I want to see restoration. I want to see healing come. And then he calls upon a friend, and we don't really know their name. Some people think that the name is the word... Um, uh, dear friend or burden bearer, Syntyche or something along the, oh no, Syntyche is the woman. Uh, I, I forget the name because it doesn't get translated in uh, in this translation, but Paul calls upon a third party to help resolve this disagreement. And that is, that that's part of the work of the church. That's part of what church is about, relationship. And Paul just makes that so clear here at the end of Philippians. So, um, so that's just something beautiful that we can see in his letter to the Philippians. I wanted to to point out. Now, then he gets back into the main point of the letter. And this is where we get that phrase, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice, rejoice always in the Lord. So here it is in the Passion, verse four. Be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Let joy overflow for you are united with the anointed one. So, there is the message of Philippians. There is the message as Paul writes from his imprisonment, his own quarantine. Paul is saying, do not, do not forget what this is all about, the joy of the kingdom. I heard somebody say recently that joy is one third of the kingdom of God, which is an interesting, uh, interesting look at Romans 15, where it says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. One third of the entire kingdom is joy. So Paul is making that clear and he is letting them know that joy flows out of their union. That word union is the key to unlocking everything in the Bible, everything in your life, everything that we're called to. It is all found in union with Christ. And so um, so that's the message. And then he goes into, uh, you know, an issue that inhibits our joy. Now, last week, if you were Following along, uh, we dealt with one of the number one inhibitors of joy, which is religion. Um, right now, Paul is going to address uh, another major inhibitor, which is anxiety. Okay, so um, all of you, I'm assuming, 90, 95% of you, I'm sure, at least, have 
heard many times Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9, and even the later, the later passages. Um, these have been quoted left and right for the eight for ages. Now, um, you know, the whole thing about prayer, pray without ceasing. Um, you know, uh, I, I just I just want you to hear this right now as though for the first time. OK, um, I'm going to read it from this translation again. So it'll be a little different. So hopefully it comes to you with some fresh ears uh, and, and, and you can hear it in a new way. But um, but this verse, be anxious for nothing. OK, I want you to really lock into this right now and, and hear this as though for the first time. OK. Verse six. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So, Keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Follow the example of all that we have imparted to you, and the God of peace will be with you in all things. Okay. Here's here's one way that I would sum this up. There's I, I don't I don't even know how to address this this passage adequately. Like I this is this is I feel like I'm just coming up to a, a a huge mountain that there's so many different trails that you could go up the mountain. So many different beautiful passageways to get to the top, and I don't even know which way to go. I'm just going to pick one immediate path of what comes to mind to get to where Paul's leading us, which is the secret of joy and contentment. But all that I want to point out as we work through this particular, um, this particular verse is this, this reality that Paul taught us to make our minds work for us and not against us. Okay. Um, because here, here, here's a secret for you from the mystics and from those who understand meditation and, and, and transcending, you know, the natural limitations of the mind and all that stuff. A secret for you today is that you cannot quiet your mind by yourself. You can't control your mind. You, your mind is not something that you have to grab hold of and beat into subjection. In fact, the more that you try to do that, uh, the more that you will actually stir up the waters inside of you and create more waves of anxiety in the first place. And there's a lot of stuff out there, well-intentioned teaching about harnessing the mind that actually becomes a new form of religion, a new form of law, a system of self-effort. And anybody that has begun to plumb the depths, the masters of, of prayer and contemplation and meditation have all realized that your battle is not against your own mind, okay? That's not what we're called to do. Your mind is meant to turn and spin. It is a clock that is not meant to stop, okay? So it's meant to continually turn and move and, and, and take in information and process. The key is setting it in the right direction, okay? And yes, I saw that comment there from Lisa about how we have the mind of Christ realizing that our minds are good. Our minds are good, okay? Your mind is not a playground for the devil. It is a playground for the Holy Spirit of God. You need to begin to even relook at how you see your mind. So it's about making your mind work for you and not against you. Because either way, your mind's gonna work and you just wanna make sure it's, it's moving in the right direction. So the key here then is when anxiety is going to come, okay? Um, even Jesus experienced fear and anxiety that came over him. We see that in the garden of Gethsemane, okay? Just because you experience fear and anxiety doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. You're actually, you know, reacting according to the physical uh, mechanisms that God put inside of you. That's okay. The key is, is, is turning it in the right direction when the fear comes. So Paul is saying when anxiety comes, 
Turn it into prayer. Let that stuff that's bothering you be turned around into an opportunity to cultivate relationship with God. So let it become oil to fuel you, okay? You know where oil comes from? Crude oil that went into the negatives in the market this week. Crazy news about the economy and oil prices. Just everything's being turned upside down in our world right now. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. But oil, crude oil, this this immensely important commodity in our world, oil is made from dead organisms, right? Out of death, out of death comes the, the very substance that we put into our cars. It's a really strange and weird thing if you think about it too much. But that's what oil is. Oil, oil is fossil fuel. It is fuel that comes out of fossils, which are dead beings, okay? So out of death, comes something that creates energy, which is life, which is movement, okay? So out of things that come and that seem to bring decay, that seem to bring death, that bring uh, depression, the Lord is saying here, you can actually allow that stuff to be converted into energy. You can allow that stuff to fuel your relationship with God and you can turn everything into prayer and into a renewed focus on the Lord. And you can begin to fasten your thoughts on what is pure and holy and true. And that will begin to then cause a new momentum in your life. And, you know, remember, Paul is writing this from quarantine. Okay. He had a lot of time to twiddle his thumbs. I mean, just think about it. He just, he was just sitting there and he didn't have Netflix. Okay. My goodness, what suffering Paul endured right? He didn't have Netflix to go on to. He, there was a lot of twiddling of his thumbs. There was a lot of boredom. Paul engaged in the playground of his mind, but he discovered something in the midst of it, that there is actually a wellspring of joy that you can tap into, whether you're bored or busy, whether you're excited or dispassionate, no matter where you are, there is this hidden well of Christ in you, and it's actually his death. His death has become the fossil fuel to empower your life and to give you energy of the Spirit of God to put oil into your lamps to cause you to burn. At any moment, you could begin to tap into the mind of Christ. You could begin to turn around whatever it is you're experiencing on the outside and enjoy your union with Jesus and this is a beautiful, beautiful thing that Paul is inviting the Philippians to tap into in order to uh, release joy into their lives. The Lord wants us to be joyful. Can I just say that very, very clearly and boldly that the Lord wants us happy, okay? I know there's a lot of teachings out there that say, well, joy is different from happiness and I get it. I understand why people teach that. But don't get religious about the word joy. Don't turn it into this old Anglican King James holy statement. Oh, just be filled with the joy of the Lord and just be content in Christ, which really means be depressed and beat yourself up all the time and call that joy. That's not the joy that Paul is writing about. That's not the word charis in the Greek where we get the word joy from. The word he's using has to do with delight of the soul, happiness, Real emotion, real smiles. God wants you to smile. He wants you to be filled with joy and it comes through your union with Jesus Christ. And so I just wanna call all of us, Jesus, give us all grace to tap into that, to turn anxiety into fuel for joy. Amen, amen. Okay, I gotta keep going here because he keeps uh, he keeps speaking and you know he says that, Oh, when you pray, when you turn this stuff into prayer, he says that God's wonderful peace that transcends your understanding will make the answers known to you. Now, this is gold, what I'm about to tell you, all right? This is like this is like Apple stock in the 1980s, okay? If you can if you can invest into what I'm about to say from Philippians 4, you're going to be a rich uh a rich individual in the days ahead. Um what Paul is getting at here is that God's peace gives you the answers that you seek. And let me say this in a different way. Your number one pursuit shouldn't be answered prayer. Your number one pursuit should be the peace of Christ, which brings about answered prayer. Give 
give me a thumbs up or something if that makes sense or if that, you know, I don't know. There you go. All right. Amen. I heard Rich get, got it. So, so our, our, if our focus is just on answered prayer, um, we're throwing ourselves into the waters of anxiety and tossing and turning. If our focus is on the peace of Christ, I'm not saying don't pray. I'm not saying don't believe for answers. But what I'm saying is that if your focus is first and foremost on embracing the peace of Christ, that is actually what Paul says is how the answers get made known to you. It's from the place of peace. This is the realm that Jesus abided in. And it's in this realm that he spoke to the wind, he spoke to the waves, and he caused things to change on the outside. We keep coming back to this. I keep coming back to this quote from Bill Johnson. I've said now a few times, I love it, where he says, um, bold faith, like powerful, miraculous faith, stands on the shoulders of that quiet trust. Okay, it's that quiet peace. That has to become our joy and pursuit. That's what releases answered prayer. I'm telling you, we can tap into that and invest into that. It's gonna yield incredible, incredible reward in the days ahead. And we are in a season of time now where we can make investments in that way. And we can take time to renew our mind and to think even about our thinking. All right. All right. So um, let's keep going here. Verse 10. Paul says, my heart overflows with joy when I think of how you showed your love to me by your financial support of my ministry. For even though you have so little you still continue to help me at every opportunity. I'm not telling you this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be satisfied in any circumstance. I know what it means to lack, and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. There it is. There's Paul's secret. There is the essence of every single thing that we've been looking at in this letter, this beautiful and timeless letter that I believe the Lord has called us to focus on as we are all in a season of, of, of reflection and contemplation. And, um, And what he said from the beginning, if you remember all the way back in chapter one, Paul's surrender to live as Christ, to die as gain. Paul came to this place of surrender that whether in fullness or hunger, abundance or lack, prosperity or suffering, his focus was on the internal Christ, union with Jesus. That was his secret, okay? Paul was not anti-prosperity and pro-suffering. This is so important to get, okay? Because there is, again, so much religious teaching out there. It's that Judaizer teaching we talked about last week. Those mutilators of the flesh who want to make the Christianity into this suffering party. Paul Paul is not pro-suffering, anti-prosperity. He says here that whether I'm prospering or suffering, that's not my focus. My focus is on Christ within me. That's my secret, that I'm in union with Jesus. And listen, the deal is you're going to suffer regardless. You don't have to go pursuing it. You don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to make this thing into your sanctifying grace in your life that's going to save you if you somehow go through some kind of suffering or whatever. Like, it's going to come. So Paul actually, you know, God doesn't want us to suffer. It's part of the curse. Uh, we're supposed to live in prosperity. That's why in heaven there are gold and stones and all kinds of beautiful things there. Like there's not gonna be poverty and suffering in heaven. So we might as well get used to living in abundance and prosperity now. But in this life, we still will experience suffering. And Paul is saying, look, the secret, the mystery of it all is contentment, is turning your mind, turning your heart into Christ within where that, begins to well up in you as a fountain of joy, okay? Virtual high five right now. Joy through union with Christ. That is the invitation. That is how we rise. That is what God is bringing his bride into is a deeper drink, a deeper experience, a deeper encounter of the one who dwells 
within us. He's opening our eyes. He's giving us opportunity to have 2020 vision. I, I loved um, Kathy Glatz on our elder team had a word that was sent out. Hopefully, again, you receive our newsletters and on our Almond Branch page because the elder team is going to be doing this, I believe, every week. But she sent out a message this week about the eyes of the imagination, that our imagination have eyes. And God wants us to see with the eyes of our imagination, the eyes of our heart. He wants us to see his kingdom and see his glory. So she called us into that. That is the call in this season and time to see the glory of Jesus. This is right at your fingertips. The time is at hand. Listen, for those who have ears to hear right now, okay? And listen, I'm preaching to a crowd, a digital crowd, but it's a human crowd nonetheless. And Jesus talked to crowds and he would say, he who has ears to hear, maybe not everyone in this crowd watching has ears to hear. Maybe you're just scrolling through my Facebook feed and you're just looking for something to fill up your time or your day. Uh, maybe your ears haven't been pierced yet by the Lamb of God, by Jesus, but I pray he does. I pray that he opens you up and that he speaks to the depths of your soul and shows you that the kingdom of God is at hand. That doesn't mean that Jesus is coming back in 2030 or 2040. It means that Jesus is risen now and his kingdom is available to you right now. Is the Lord coming back? Yeah, but no man knows the day or hour, so don't be swept away with all of these end time teachings out there trying to nail down the specifics. The kingdom is at hand, which means joy is at hand. Joy is at your fingertips. That is what I wanna leave with you guys as we close up Philippians. Now, Paul makes one last comment here, and I just have to say this personally, and thank you, Jesus, again, for making these truths just uh, alive and awaken within us. But I, I just have to say this on a personal level because this book really is for us today. It really has a, a personal message. And even for our, our church family watching this, um, Paul is thanking them for their financial support. And, and he says to them, you've so graciously provided for my essential needs during this season of difficulty and he says, I want you to know that the Philippian church was the only church that supported me in the beginning as I went out to preach the gospel. You were the only church that sowed into me financially. And when I was in Thessalonica, you supported me for well over a year. And look, he says, I mentioned this not because I'm requesting a gift. I love that. Paul's like, I'm not trying to manipulate an offering right here. And we're not taking another offering right now. Um, but Paul says, I just want you to know so that the fruit of your generosity may bring you an abundant reward. He says, I now have all that I need, more than enough. I'm abundantly satisfied for I've received the gift you've sent by Epaphroditus and I viewed it as a sweet sacrifice perfume with the fragrance of your faithfulness, which is so pleasing to God. And then he says this, this is really what I wanted to, to leave you with. He says, I'm convinced that my God will fully satisfy every need that you have. Say that out loud right now. My God will fully satisfy every need that I have. My God will fully satisfy every need that I have. And he says, for I have seen the abundant riches of glory revealed to me through the anointed one, Jesus Christ. And God, our father will receive all the glory and the honor throughout the eternity of eternities, amen. So I, I wanted to read that just, just to acknowledge, again, um, the blessing of the community of faith, of people who are still giving and sowing into the kingdom during this time, just as a pure thank you. But I also wanted to highlight Paul's heart here when he said that God is gonna supply all of your needs, okay? Never lose sight of that. Never enter into a fear or a greed or a hoarding mindset. The Lord is gonna meet, he's gonna fully satisfy. I love that translation. Not just meet, but satisfy your needs, okay? This is the gospel. I pray you receive it into your home. I pray you eat it and break it like bread into your being. So, with that being said, bless you guys. We're going to have communion now. Are we ready for yeah. communion? Okay, so Rich and, and Martha are going to come back and um, let's, uh, let's welcome them with some virtual likes and clapping and, uh, and they will 
they'll lead you with your communion elements right now. Okay. I'm glad that we can be um, sharing communion every week together. I just think it's it's just a wonderful thing that we can do that. You know that that communion together and uh, celebrating together um, communion. Um, one thing I was thinking of for uh, regarding communion, you know, Jesus gave us, he always spoke to the disciples. And at the Last Supper, um, that was really at their Passover. I mean, you know, they had that first, first Last Supper. And Passover is a time when the Jewish people are celebrating their escape from slavery and, and from Egypt, you know. And, um, and it, even though Jesus was keeping this tradition of celebrating Passover together, he brought this in as, as, as such a celebration. He was keeping the Jewish tradition um, which was familiar to all the disciples. And yet in this Passover, he created this new tradition with the breaking of the bread and the, and the wine. Um, in Acts 2, I really like the verse where it shares about in the early church how um, the breaking of the bread with one another from home to home was just a common mm -hmm. occurrence. How they just remembered, you know, they they broke their bread yes. together and they and they had the communion to to remember and it wasn't to be solemn, it was to celebrate. It was to really remember, you know, what the what he did for them. And we have our own traditions. We've always had our own traditions of communion. Um, whether um, if, if you used to go to a church and in the pews, they would just pass it out or whatever. But we have these new traditions now, which is so wonderful. And I really think that even during this COVID, like we've had this new celebration of communion together. You know, and I really believe there'll be new communion times for all of us. And um, I really like the fact every time I think of the word communion, I think of common union. Um, I think of common union that we all have with him, with Father, mm -hmm. Son, and Spirit. But we also have that common union together with each other and, and with the world and our neighborhoods, too. And the verse that I wanted to share... Um, um, from Ephesians, it says, for it was his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus, the anointed one. So his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace. For the same love he has for his beloved one, Jesus has for us. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. And I just think, you know, every time we take communion, um, we're remembering together and we're reminded of his true love for us and for one another and for, and for the world. Hmm. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, I was thinking um, along with Martha, we were talking about the creative ways of communion. And I was thinking back to uh, John chapter 21, uh, where uh, Jesus appears to the disciples uh, after his uh, resurrection, but before his ascension, and a similar time as right now in, in the church calendar for us. And in that particular scene, Peter's with a group of his friends, uh, fellow disciples, and says, hey, I want to go fishing. You know, that's what I love to do. Uh, he says, let's go. And his friends go, yeah, we'll go with you. So they're all going out fishing. So I was thinking about it. What does fishing represent to Peter? What does it mean? Well, it really, it, for him, it was like the familiar, the past, um, his gift, right? It was what he was good at, uh, a place of provision. But I was thinking how strange it must have felt to him because of the fact with all the things that have been going on for those couple of weeks. First of all, his leader, Jesus, taken away from him, uh, his denial of Jesus three times, uh, Jesus going to the cross and him seeing him die and just the agony of going through that. And then the amazing um, resurrection and, and going through all of these things. So Peter's going through this amazing turmoil in his life. And then he says, let me go back. Let me go fish. I need to, I need to do some fishing. And I was thinking, um, 
what an uneasy place that must have been for him. It must have felt so weird and so different because he knew that he was on the threshold of something new. So um, I, was, I happened to be reading this morning one of my uh, favorite authors, Richard Rohr. Um, he does a daily devotion that I really enjoy. And he was talking about a liminal place. If you haven't heard that word before, it's simply a place where you, it's almost an uneasy place of transition where you're coming out of something old, something you've been in, going into something new. And, and you're, it, the, one of the ways that it, it's shown is, this is a very simple explanation, but when you get into an elevator in a building that you don't know, the feeling as you're going up to the floor, what's that floor gonna be like? You know, you're going somewhere you've never been. Uh, it's just a very simple example, but that's kind of a liminal space while you're in that elevator. Well, um, COVID-19 has kind of put us, the world, most of the world, in kind of a liminal space. We're wondering what's the world going to look like in uh, two or three months? Um, in a few years, will it ever be the same? You know, will, will we ever be going back? Um, where's the familiar? Where's what was always familiar to me? Um, will I be able to go back to fishing? Will I be able to go back to what I was doing before? So here's Peter in this liminal space, in this awkward in-between spot. And here comes Jesus to assure his heart. I love this. So I love what Jesus does, and he does what Jesus always does, right? He, he prepares a meal. He makes a breakfast. He calls out to Peter. He calls, hey, you guys caught, caught anything? Well, Peter hadn't caught a thing, had he? He'd gone back to doing what he used to do, and his net came up empty. Had absolutely nothing to show. Uh, but Jesus calls out to him, tells him where to fish. Says, hey, you haven't caught anything? Try that over there. And, and they catch so many fish, they can't, the, the boat's sinking. Peter jumps in the water, comes in, sits down with Jesus, and, and Jesus has breakfast with him. So I realize this is kind of a long way to come to communion, but um, really that was a communion of sorts, a beautiful communion that Jesus sat there with all the disciples that were with Peter that day. They all came in and just broke bread with them, ate some of their fish, which I thought was so interesting as I was thinking of it this morning, some of their catch which he engineered for them, but he still said, give me some of your fish. He had already cooked fish, but he took some of theirs as well. And they just had a great, great feast together. Um, and then following the meal, Jesus does even more. He takes Peter aside and he, he, he reminds Peter of his true call. And that's what communion does with us, I believe. Every time that we celebrate communion, it's a time of feasting uh, with, our, with our Father, Father, Son, and Spirit. And, and he reminds, reminded Peter not just of his call to take care of his own physical needs by fishing. He, he didn't say to Peter, you can never fish again. But he reminded him to take care of the needs of those around him. Mm -hmm. And why? why? Why would he do that? Because he knows that that's the sweet spot for us. When we are together, when we're having communion with him, and then we're reaching out and, and blessing those around us, that is our sweet spot. That's what we were designed for. It's the beauty of the body. So um, I'm I just, just going to read this, this uh, last thought here. As we take communion today, God reminds us of how much he longs to dine with us and commune with you and me. He also reminds us again of our higher calling to care for the needs of his body. Why? Because he knows for each one of us, this is the place of highest contentment, the place of pure joy that Nick was speaking about just a few minutes ago, and our true home in a time where we stand at heaven's threshold. This is a liminal time right now. Things will never be the same, but we have such an opportunity to make it amazing to bring the kingdom of God here. And as, so as we celebrate communion right now, we're, we're just knowing that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit are here with us. They're with you. We're together uh, right now. All of us are together. 
And we are just going to enjoy this time, this threshold time. Mm -hmm. So if you have your um, bread, if you'd like to get that. Thanks. Yeah, you want to show you? can show you. Okay. So we have this bread here representing the body of Christ, representing all of us, representing the body that was broken for us. And uh, Martha, you want to say a prayer? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've given for us. And we thank you that you were that sacrifice for us. The body was broken for, for us, for forgiveness. We just thank you for all that we can re receive from you for what you did for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there was a verse um, of, the, of the line from Ephesians as well. It says, since we are now joined to Christ, mm -hmm. we have been given the treasures of redemption by his blood. Yes. The total cancellation of our sins, all because of the cascading riches of his grace. And that, I just really feel that's such a beautiful verse regarding that treasures of redemption. That, that I love that, that word in there. there are treasures of redemption by his blood. And I just, it just, it's just very, very beautiful for me to share. Mm, beautiful. Oh, so Father, Son, and Spirit, we, we just are here together. We are so grateful. Lord Jesus, for the blood that you poured out on our behalf mm -hmm. and the behalf of the whole world, mm -hmm. the entire world. We just are so grateful. We thank you for our union with you. Mm -hmm. As Martha said, our communion, common union with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just rejoice in, in your spending time with us mm -hmm. so that as we transition in this space, we know that you're with us. In this liminal space, you are with us, mm -hmm. guiding us, leading us. And we just rejoice in that. Thank you, Thank you yes. Jesus. Thank you. Take and drink. Amen. Thank you for sharing this with us. And uh, Pastor Nick is going to come back. Um, we will see you soon. Yeah. All right. Well, this is uh, another special Sunday in place of not being together. Um, hey, I, I just want to put this out there. Next month, I am believing for miraculous encounters with the Holy Spirit. Um, we received a prophetic word about the month of May and miracles, and I want to just completely open up our eyes and hearts to that. I believe the Lord is going to be doing miracles in our families, in our bodies, in our hearts. He's just going to be releasing his presence, manifesting himself. We declare the miracles and the presence and the glory of God breaking out in this season. We thank you for that, Lord. We receive that. And um, the story that, you know, Rich uh, referred to, that was in that time between Passover and Pentecost when Jesus would show up miraculously, often around food. In fact, maybe it was every time. It would be good to do a study on that because I know that all the disciples were together in the upper room and Jesus walked through the wall. I'm pretty sure there was food there. Um, the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus were breaking bread and yeah, Jesus cooked breakfast for Peter and there's there's probably one or two more stories. But anyway, Jesus came, to, came in a new way of communion to the disciples and the old way was fading out and a new way was coming in. That was really good what Rich shared about this liminal place that we're in. So in this time leading up to Pentecost, let's let's really open up our hearts and eyes to the presence of the Lord coming in, manifesting, doing incredible things. We're going to keep taking communion. We're going to keep uh, looking for uh, breakthrough for heaven on earth. So um, so we thank you, Jesus, for that. So.
Um, that's it. So we'll be back again next week and you'll get, you know, any other updates that you need through, you know, email and the app and the other things that they mentioned. So again, bless you guys be released into your day, into this next week with joy unspeakable because you are full of glory. Amen.